Welcome back to the video. So in this one we're going to be building a very nice toolbox to hold some of my hand tools. Now what's funny about this project is that in the beginning it did not start out as a toolbox. I had this idea for a way to make a tray that I thought might look kind of interesting and from there just kind of spiraled out of control until it turned into a toolbox for all of my hand tools, or most of my hand tools anyway. Now what I'm trying to deal with right now is I do not have a lot of money to go out and buy lumber and as you can see from my lumber pile I've got a decent amount of it just kicking around so through trying to find small projects that I can work on with just the lumber that I have this one actually seemed kind of perfect. So I had this 6 quarter cherry that I could resaw down to get my 5 8 sidewall pieces and again this worked out just perfectly. I actually have another video on my channel about building a toolbox and what I found when I built that one is that you really don't need as thick material as you might think. So on that one I think I used 3 quarter thick stock for all my sidewalls and that and it was solid white oak and very very heavy. So for this one I do decide to go with 5 eighths of an inch because I did want a decent amount of strength in there. This is not a toolbox that you're going to be carrying around all day anything like that. But I still wanted it to be nice and strong but again still lightweight enough that I could actually move it around when it was fully loaded up with tools. So this not only gave me just some good quality stock, but it also gave me a little bit of a book match between my sides. Again, this is not something, you know, this is not a desired feature by any stretch of the imagination. You know, I, I usually use book matches just because it's more functional, but it is a nice subtle touch when you can, when you pick up on it. And then one of the things that I'm trying to do on this project is to use a lot of hand tools. Like I said at the beginning, I've started to build up a good collection of hand tools and I want to use them. So anytime I finish these boards, you know, I get them out of the plane or I get them out of that rough milling stage, I'm going to go through and finish them off the hand plane just because this gives it a nice, really true flat surface. With all of our pieces milled to size, we can move on to our joinery. So for the case joinery, we're going to be using some hand cut dovetails. Now, if you watched my, uh, one of my recent projects where I did the dovetail hanging cabinet, in that video I talked about how I'm kind of becoming more of a fan of machine cut dovetails because they're just easier overall, and a lot of the times there's not much point between, you know, going between hand cut dovetails and machine cut dovetails. But this is one of those specific situations where hand cut dovetails are given give me the exact look I want, because I want that little rougher cut finish. You know, machine cut dovetails do generally tend to be very perfect. You know, they're all at the exact same angle, whereas on, when you hand cut them, there's some variation to them. The other benefit of hand cutting is you can make smaller pins, and that's exactly what I'm going to use here. My pins at the top are about 3 16ths of an inch, uh, whereas when you hand or when you use a machine, you would only be able to get about a quarter inch minimum size. So again, hand cutting does have its benefits, and on a smaller project like this, I really do enjoy doing it. Plus, this project is all about just getting in and using my hand tools, so it just seemed like it made sense to hand cut these dovetails. So it's a very hard debate in your own head, especially when you have the option to take the easier route of machine cutting the dovetails to kind of get over that hurdle of wanting to hand cut them. But again, the thing is, is that for me, it's all about which one I enjoy more, what I'm going to enjoy more in the situation. So again, I've talked about this plenty of times now. If I'm doing something like a blanket chest with dovetails, that just makes sense to do on a machine because it's big. I can use the machine to get through that work nice and quickly and keep it enjoyable. Whereas on something as small as this toolbox, I can just take my time. It's only an afternoon to you know, cut these dovetails, get them fitted up and all that. So it is a lot more enjoyable to take the time and not have to deal with the router and the mess that that creates. So enough about that whole debate of machine cut versus hand cut, we're just going to move through the process here. So obviously we start by cutting the tails, getting those shaped up, and then using the chisel to cut to the baseline. From there we can go through and mark that onto our second board, and this is again the best way to do it. If you have a machine cutting dovetail jig, that makes alignment so much easier. Obviously you don't need to have one of these jigs specifically for that purpose, but if you happen to have one sitting in your shop, I would definitely recommend using it. Uh, from there though, we can move on to cutting our pins. Now the pins are what is actually the most complicated part of cutting a dovetail. I think a lot of people think that the tails portion is what's complicated because you're cutting at that weird angle, but the pins are the reason that I sometimes don't like cutting dovetails. Mainly because there's a lot more material to clear out, there's a lot more chance of things breaking or going wrong, I generally have never had an issue when cutting the tails on my dovetails, it's always on the pin board. So the pin board is all about just taking your time, and I love using this router trick because it just gives me a nice even baseline all the way through. You'll also notice on these dovetails that I did them kind of symmetrical but different sizes. So our middle our middle tail is just a little bit wider, I believe it's 2 inches if I remember correctly, and then our outer ones are about 1.5 inches. This just added in a little bit of extra visual detail by changing up the sizes, and it's definitely something I'm going to be doing more in my future projects because I think it just looks really cool. 
Now the one mistake I did make is during the fit up here, I used my normal pencil trick where you put a little bit of pencil on the inside face of the dovetails and then you use that to figure out where your high spots are. Now that this ran into a little bit of a problem because I wanted to leave my joinery protruding, I wasn't able to clean it up as nicely after the glue up. So there was some small pencil marks in that visible, but again, it's not that big of a deal. It really blends into the cherry and it's not like it stands out. It's just one of those things that I would do differently in the future. From there, we can move on to making our handle mounts. I don't quite know what the proper terminology for these is, but this is kind of the whole reason this project existed. I had this idea for how to, ha how to mount a handle onto a tray that I thought would be really cool. So I'm taking these two pieces of basically quarter sawn white oak. They're a little bit of the, the grain is at a little bit of an angle, but again, that just kind of adds to the overall look. And I'm sticking them together because I want to make sure that these two mounts are completely identical. This is the best way to do it. So we're gonna start by cutting the dovetail shape. So I'm just laying out some lines here and then marking in a diagonal that's about an, a one to eight ratio, the same ratio as my normal dovetail. With the lines marked, we can take our piece over to the bandsaw and cut our straights. So going down from the top side of where these mounts are, uh, we're gonna follow this line until we hit that center mark that I've laid it out and that's where we're gonna stop the blade. Again, you wanna use a bandsaw for this because obviously it works a lot easier. We can then remove that material to make cutting a little bit easier later on. Then to cut our dovetail portion, I made this little jig that's just a piece of MDF with some sticky back sandpaper on it that'll hold the piece at that angle consistently. This just made it a lot easier to guide that piece at that accurate angle all the way through the cut. I wasn't quite sure how the best way to top these things off would be, so I decided to go with kind of this cathedral point. Uh, I don't know if that's the end proper terminology, that's just kind of the first thing that I thought of when I saw this shape. And I have to say I do quite like it, it's a little, it's a little decorative for my taste normally, but in this case I think it worked nicely. Then I'm going to go through and use a card scraper to remove all the bandsaw marks. There aren't actually any other tools that really would work here because you want to keep that nice sharp angle of the dovetail portion and kind of blend it seamlessly into the straight portion. So you really got to take your time and again the card scraper by far the best tool. Then I can go back in with my spoke shave and just tune up that top curve a little bit. Again all I'm trying to do right now is just remove the bandsaw marks. I'm not trying to actually really shape anything or make things look good. To mount in the handle, again I wanted to use some through joinery to match up with our through dovetails that make up the casework. So again with the pieces attached together, I'm going to cut my mortises at the same time through both of them because this is just the easiest way to make sure that they are completely identical with each other and they're going to line up when I have the whole tray together. So going a little bit more of the traditional style of cutting a mortise here, you know, I know you guys haven't seen me do this very often, uh, but this is one of those things with through joinery, I definitely like to take my time and do it by hand as much as possible. So we're just going to go through and clean up from both sides, getting those nice squared up mortises. So if you're like me and through joinery of pretty much any kind intimidates you, my best advice is to just go for it. That's what I've been trying to do on a lot of my recent projects. You'll notice that I've been doing a lot more through joinery. It's one of those things that I really love the look of it, but it does stress me out and I'm trying to get better at it. So by just doing it on a project, you know, not giving myself the option to not do it, uh, I found that that is actually really helping me improve at it. Then we get on to mounting these attachment points to our tray. So again, the whole thing here is that these are the dovetail shapes. We're not just going to glue them right to the wood. That would be, that wouldn't be cool at all. So we're going to be inlaying them slightly into this piece of cherry that makes up our sidewalls. Now these pieces are about a half inch thick. We're going to be inlaying them a quarter of an inch. Just that way, again, this piece is protruding from that cherry sidewall. So the theme that started developing with this project is I just wanted to make things not be flat because what will happen with a lot of new woodworkers or people that are fairly early on in their woodworking is you just tend to kind of make everything smooth and flat. And what that does is it, it's the piece still looks good, don't get me wrong, but when you add in those different depths and a little bit of texture and all these different shapes and that into a piece, it definitely brings in a little bit of extra detail and can make your piece just that much cooler. Again, it does take a little bit of extra work because you gotta be very careful with your joinery, but it is well worth the effort when you see it in that final form.
And so like I mentioned, texture is another important thing for making non-flat pieces. So with the sidewalls of this tray, these were very flat in my opinion, and I didn't like the look of them. I really wanted to bring in some texture, and stippling is by far my favorite way to add in texture. Now, if you guys have been following me for a while, you may have seen that I've used this technique a few times in the past, and I absolutely love it. Uh, this method of hand cutting it is actually my preferred. It does majorly hurt. My wrists and hands are still in a ton of pain from doing this. I've got blisters on my fingers, but it just looks so dang good. But anyway, you can see that I'm going through and doing my beveling after I do my stippling because that just helps blend the stippling into that bevel a little better. If you do it the other way around, it doesn't always look very good. With our side pieces done, we can then move on to our handle supports and then go through and just bevel the edges, round them over, add, just smooth them up a little bit. So I wasn't going for any kind of one specific style edge profile, I just wanted to kind of break those edges. Then I can take those pieces and glue them together. Now I'm gluing them together with some type on two here, and in case you're worried about wood movement, don't be. The piece of cherry and this piece of walnut are not wide enough to really encounter any major enough wood movement that's gonna split these pieces. Moving on to our longer sidewalls of the tray, this is where I got a little bit lazy and it was actually turned out to be for the better. So looking at this piece, I did not want to spend my entire day or probably multiple days stippling these pieces because I knew it would be a really painful thing to do. So I came up with this little bit of a curved design to put near the edges so that it would blend and go over our dovetails and we'd have about an inch off the bottom of the tray that would have this stippling to it. And this helps bring in just a little bit more balance. If you look at like our side pieces, how we have that walnut that is nice and clean and flat you know we don't have any texture to it it's just clean straight grain then we have we're combining that with that stippled cherry piece and we want to create that same or a similar look on these longer side pieces so by combining that flat cherry on the top there with that stippling along the bottom that just helps blend the texture because when you're adding texture to a piece like this it's all about finding balance between the clean wood that we're used to and the texture that you've decided to add in Onto the bottom panel now, this is a very easy part of the project. We're just fitting a floating panel into a groove. Now, one thing that's important to mention is this groove is set 3 eighths of an inch up from that bottom edge. Typically when I make a box or something, I'll do, you know, a quarter inch or 3 sixteenths of an inch if I want to, you know, save space inside the box. But in this case, I want to have that little bit of extra material on the bottom for that added strength. Because we're going to be loading this thing up with a whole bunch of hand planes and other heavy tools, we want to have as much strength in there as possible. I'm also making sure to use the router here so that I can do stopped grooves so that they don't stick out through my protruding dovetails and I have to go back in and fill a gap later on. So depending on how long you've been following me, you might actually recognize this panel. This panel has been sitting in my shop for over a year now. Uh, because I actually made it back when I was doing the pie cupboard, which was one of my first big projects on YouTube. And uh, what I was going to do is use these panels for the door panels there. And this was before I had the drum stand or really any way to get this panel nicely flattened up. And this was really before I learned about the usefulness of hand tools. So it's really great now that I could just grab this panel out of my lumber pile and put it towards a really good project. It's this beautiful walnut panel with some nice uh, crazy grain going through it and that. And overall it looked really good. To fit this panel into the grooves, I'm using a shaker profile bit. So this is basically just a rabbiting bit that rather than having a square edge, it has a 22 degree angle on it. This just makes the transition a little bit nicer and you know takes away that sharp edge and overall just looks really nice in my opinion. It's a nice subtle touch even compared to adding in like a cove profile or a round over like I have done in the past. With the tray dry assembled, I could start trying to figure out my handle. Now this is one of the parts that had me very confused as to kind of how to approach it. Because all I knew is that I need to have a piece that had a nice slight arc to it, but also I need to match up these two tenons into those mortises that I'd already cut. So this was definitely, definitely a very complicated thing to kind of figure out. But again, just by taking my time, you know, fitting up these tenons very, very carefully and having that tray sitting there, I was able to go kind of back and forth until I got those tenons to perfectly fit between those other two walnut pieces. Once I had those tenons set up, then I could go in and add in my curvature and shape my handle. 
So I'm adding in a three quarter inch deep curve here. So if we're measuring down from the top to that edge is three quarter of an inch and then in from the bottom up to the middle is three quarters of an inch. And I found that this just gave me a really nice subtle curve. You know, I'm not going for anything, you know, wild or crazy here. So I start by just roughing out the material on the bandsaw because this just lets me get that curve established without a whole ton of work. With the curve roughed out, I now get to use one of my favorite tools. This is a Stanley number 113 compass plane, and if you've never seen one of these before, basically all it is is a hand plane with a sole that can be shaped or curved to fit whatever curve you're working on. So you can work convex or concave curves, and this just really lets you get a perfectly shaped curve. Now in the case of this project, it wasn't all that necessary as you're going to see in just a second here, but it was a fun time to use that tool. With that curve established, I'm going to go through and carve this handle. So what we're going for here is just a nice rounded over shape. Now if you really want to make it easy on yourself, you could go through and use a router for this, but because this project was all about using hand tools and you know just trying to enjoy that hybrid method of woodworking, I decided to use my spoke shape. And the other kind of benefit to this that I didn't really think about is the feeling and the texture that a spoke shape leaves. Now with a flat bottom spoke shape like this, anytime you're trying to cut a rounded shape, you're rounding over edges, you're always going to be left with these very small facets, which are, which are basically just flat points along the curve. And this feels amazing. When you hold this handle with those facets in there, it feels really cool. It kind of just tells your brain, you know, you know for a fact that this thing was carved by hand. It was shaped by hand with a spoke shave or whatever tool. And it's a really cool feeling. So in order to keep those facets in there, I started with 150 grit sanding, just really, really light sanding, and then went up to 180 grit after that, just doing everything I could to kind of smooth out those facets, but not take them out completely. With the handle all shaped up, we could then start working on the fit up. So because my joinery here was not perfect, all I had to do was add in this little bevel to the edges and this just helps kind of hide things or just makes it look a little bit more decorative when you do have gaps. So this is another little trick that I've learned with through joinery that you can do is it just makes it a little bit easier. So annoyingly enough, the footage for the glue up ended up getting corrupted, but the one important thing to mention is that I used hide glue here so that if there's any leftover on the protruding joinery, either the dovetails or the mortise and tenon on the handle, it's not going to affect the finish. Since hide glue is porous, the, the oil finish we're going to use later on will just go right through it and will still color the wood and make it look the same as everywhere else. Now at this point, the toolbox is ready to go. We've got a box that I could put tools in and start using. But the problem is, is that all my tools are very expensive and the last thing I want is for them to be bashing around and hitting each other. So we're gonna start working on some internal organization and this is gonna be all based around my low angle jack. So I'm gonna start by figuring out how much space I need for my low angle jack and then basing everything else off of that. So after figuring out how much space I need for the Lego jack, I decided I could get these two other compartments. Now this compartment on the far right side here is gonna be used for my spoke shave and setup logs. Then to keep the planes from sliding around, we're gonna be adding in these, uh, I believe they're quarter inch by half inch pieces of walnut, uh, just these simple strips I just go between them and stop the planes moving from side to side. Now the important thing here is you want to leave a sixteenth of an inch between the plane and when you mount this piece in, otherwise it's very hard to get the plane back into the spot if you make it too tight. So all I did is just when I pin nailed them in, as you can see in just a second here, I just stuck my 116 setup block between the plane and the piece, held it nice and tightly up against it, and that gave me a perfect reference point. So I just went through and used 23 gauge pin nails to hold these in because this is nothing, you know, it doesn't need to be built bulletproof. And I did that for all of these internal components. The other benefit of this is that if I ever want to change up the layout, all I got to do is just pull these pieces out, fill some small holes, and we're good to go. We can completely change the layout of the inside of this toolbox at any point in time. So we will be left with some small pin holes, but really they're not noticeable when you do your, a little bit of filler in them anyway. And so going back to the spoke shave area, I'm making up this little lid. So this is what's actually going to separate the spoke shave from the setup plot. Now the spoke shave is not a tool that I use very often, but it's one that's nice to have. So I don't mind burying it under my setup blocks, which are kind of a pain in the butt to take out. But again, I don't use the spoke shave often enough to really make it a tool that I need to get at quickly. Then the final piece here is just extending our track. So out of that whole area that we built on the right hand side there, I wanted to make these tracks that ran over our, the, the plane section for the trays that we're going to be adding in right now. 
So I'm a big fan of organization and one of the things that I've wanted to add to my shop for probably a year or so now is a nice box to hold my chisels. And so when I started turning this into a toolbox, I figured that this was the perfect opportunity to make a nice box to hold my chisels. Now we're going to be making two boxes here, one that is specifically meant to hold my chisels and one that is meant to be left empty. So the one that's meant to be left empty is for things on a project like your hinges or screws or just hardware that seems to be floating around your shop. I want to have a specific place to put it so that I don't accidentally lose it like I have done on past projects. So these boxes are super simple. We're just starting by making a dovetailed case and that is what we're going to then attach our lid and our bottom panel to. So of course we have to use hand cut dovetails here because they just look better. I probably could have done machine cut dovetails here to save myself a little bit of time because we're not dealing with any small pins or anything like that. But again, hand cut dovetails do sometimes just look better. And in this case, it was just the easier option overall rather than going through the, all the effort of setting up the jig. Box is glued up, I could throw them in my moxin vise and just true them up, getting them all nicely squared up and so that they fit into the toolbox. Now this is the best part about working with these small boxes is that you can just throw them in your mox and vise and work on them you know, super, super easily. So I just start with the hand plane, go to the spoke shave, and then eventually finish it off with a little 180 grit hand sanding just to get that finish as good as I possibly can. For the lids and the bases of these boxes, I decided to dip into my nicer stock. So this piece you can see here is a fully quarter sawn piece of walnut that has just some of the most beautiful grain I've ever seen. Now one of the times I went to the lumber yard, I got very, very lucky with the piece that I picked up and it just happened to be fully quarter sawn. And I also had this panel that I glued up at one other point in time that I just didn't end up using. So I decided to use these for the bottom panel and the lids of these boxes because at this point, this project was just awesome. I was already in love with it and I just wanted to continually make it look that much better. So our bottom panel here is going to be probably a little bit controversial. So what I'm gonna be doing is I'm just gonna be pin nailing it on. Now, before you freak out that this is not ever gonna be strong enough, what are you gonna be able to keep in this box? I already know exactly what I'm gonna be keeping in these two boxes. In the chisel box, we're gonna be keeping five chisels, which you know probably weighs maybe five or six pounds, if that. So these pin nails are plenty strong enough to hold this in place. Now in hindsight, I do wish I'd done it a different way, and that is the same way that you're gonna see me do the lid in just a second here. So for the lid, I decided to use some 30 minute epoxy. I went to Canadian Tire to just try and figure out what a good option for gluing these on was. I saw this JB wood weld and figured why the heck not. Uh, so all this is is just a 30 minute epoxy, which allowed me to glue the lid on and get right back to work. And in hindsight, I do wish I'd done the base the same way because it just would be a little bit better than having pin nails in there. Now you might be looking at these two boxes and wondering what's going to happen when it comes to wood movement. Now on the smaller box, it's only about five inches wide, so wood movement is basically negligible. But on the larger box, it's about eight inches wide, so we do have to slightly consider wood movement. So when we do the math, because this is quarter sawn walnut, in the full maximum, you know, worst case scenario expansion, that panel will expand by about a 30 seconds of an inch. Now, if you have setup blocks, I highly recommend taking a look at them just to understand how small of an amount that is. And the other important thing you need to remember here is that's going to be out of both sides. So over both sides of that panel, we're only gonna get about a 64th of an inch of, of uh, expansion. And that is absolute worst case scenario. So all that is a very long way of saying, I'm not worried about it at all. I know that the wood that makes up the frame of these boxes is gonna have enough space in there to kind of stretch and move. To make the lids look just a little bit better and to help tie them into the toolbox, I decided to go through and stipple the lid. Now you can see here, I added in that little bit of a pencil border so I knew what area to hit and what area to not hit because we're also gonna be adding a 10 degree bevel to the lid to again, just add in a little bit of a detail and help bring in a little bit more visual interest. This also makes the boxes really separate each other while they're in the toolbox, which I think really helps too. Now, one of the things I found really interesting about this stippling technique is what happens with the grain. Now, like I said before, we're using this beautiful fully quarter sawn walnut. And one of my concerns when I started doing the stippling is I was gonna lose this beautiful straight grain. But what happens with the stippling is that once you go through and you actually put finish on and you kind of see it in this shot here, you can still very easily see that beautiful straight grain through the stippling. It doesn't do anything to kind of interfere with that. So that is, again, a very nice touch that you can still see that beautiful grain 
grain through that texture that you're adding on there. Now we just have a box in its most simplest form and all we need to do is separate the lid from the base. Now the very, very important thing here is when you're doing this on your table saw, you don't want to cut all the way through the sidewalls. So I'm cutting most of the way through and I'm leaving about a 30 seconds of an inch of material just to hold everything together. Then I can go back in with a utility knife, slice that piece of material and my lid will pop right off the base without it having any risk of binding on the table saw blade as I'm trying to separate them. This has saved me countless times from both eating the box because of kickback as well as just damaging some a box that I've been working on for a long time. With that little bit of material that's left over, it's very easy to just go through and lap it on a piece of MDF with some sandpaper on it, and this will give you two perfectly flat surfaces that'll mate up against each other really, really nicely. And anytime you have a box, you need some way to hold that lid to the box. Now there's all kinds of different ways you can do this, hinges, magnets, anything like that. But what I decided to go for here was just lining the inside of these boxes with some maple, and that'll, that'll be what creates a reference point for that lid to attach to. Now, in my opinion, and this might be a little bit controversial, but this is the classiest form of box. You know, hinges are a pretty simple thing to add in, but taking the time to fit up these pieces is actually really, really cool. Now, one of the things I want to do in the future that I, I didn't decide I didn't want to do on this project, which because I couldn't quite figure it out, is miter these pieces. Because what I'm doing right now is I'm just doing butt joints in the corner. And these don't look particularly bad. In fact, they actually kind of blend nicely with what looks like a butt joint on our dovetails. But in the future, I would like to do uh, miters on there because I do think it would look just a little bit cleaner. But again, this is a, a little bit of an easier method. And overall, it worked just as well, in my opinion. And so you can see that these maple pieces stick up about an eighth of an inch from the top of the edge of the box there, and all that's going to do is just reference the inside of the lid. Now in order for this to work, you need to go through and bevel the top edge of that maple as well as the inside edge of the lid. That'll just make sure that they don't bind up on each other as you're trying to put them together. With a box like this, it's very important to keep your lid oriented in the right direction. So I'm just adding in this small little circle on the front edge, or what is going to be the front edge, just so I always am able to orient the lid in the right direction. After doing that, I found that I liked the texture so much that I decided to add in these two small handles on either side to just make removing the lid just a little bit easier. And I left the texture nice and rough in there so it feels super cool when you go to grab it with your fingers. Moving to the internals of the chisel box now, we're going to be using two pieces to hold the chisel in place. The first piece here is going to have some rounded cutouts in it that'll help hold the body of the chisel. So I start by just getting it fitted up and then I can go through and evenly lay out my lines. So these first two are laid in a three quarter inch measurement from the outer edge and then I can just go through and use some wing dividers to just lay out my marks nice and evenly. That way all of my chisels are sitting perfectly spaced from each other inside of the box. Then over at the spindle sander, I just use that to remove the material. Now this is the safest way to do it. You could also do it using a Forstner bit with a jig, all that kind of stuff. But the spindle sander is just super simple. And I only had five little holes to do here, so it would just make more sense to do it that way. The next piece here is just a quarter inch thick strip of walnut that we're going to be adding some magnets into. Now these are neodymium magnets, so they're plenty strong to hold these chisels in place, and this will just prevent the chisels from sliding around in the box and hitting edges with each other, because that is one of the fastest way to destroy your chisels, is to have them bashing up against each other while they're in whatever storage option you're using. So both of these pieces are just super glued in. Now, one of the important things here is that I didn't put super glue over the whole length of these pieces. I only put it in about the middle third of the piece, and this will be plenty of glue to hold these in place without worry of them moving around, but it'll also allow for that movement in that bottom panel. Then the final detail of this project was lining the lids. Now, when I glued on the lids with that epoxy, I ended up getting a whole bunch of squeeze out on the inside. And I was absolutely terrified to go through and try and cut out that epoxy with a chisel like I normally would do, because I knew if I tried to do that, I would destroy the lid in some way. So I came up with this idea to just line the lid with these maple strips. And th the best part about this is you can just glue these strips right in. Because the grain on these strips is flowing in the same direction as the grain I'm making up the lid panel, these pieces are not going to ever have an issue with expansion and contraction, and they will be able to move completely together. The final part of this project is applying some tried and true original oil. Now I decided to go with original oil here because it has that nice soft beeswax texture to it that I find is just wonderful in the hands. 
So in total, I'm gonna apply three coats of oil to this piece before I start actually using it. And that'll just help prevent the wood from getting oil stains on it from my generally oily and grimy tools. Now it's a project like this that really makes me appreciate how easy it is to apply a natural oil finish like tried and true. Because if you compare it to a finish like Osmo, you gotta work pretty fast with Osmo and because it does dry fairly quickly. So if you end up leaving it jammed up in corners or you have you know streaks in that that you can't quite get into or you can't really rub it with the grain like we're gonna do inside the actual toolbox here, you can run into some issues. Whereas with this tried and true oil, all you gotta do is get that oil on there. You can leave it to soak in for a few hours if you want to and then you can always go back in and wipe out whatever excess there is even 24 48 hours later if you notice some areas where you didn't you're, you forgot to wipe off the excess oil you can easily go back in just wipe off that oil and everything is going to be fine whereas if you did that with osmo rubio polyurethane any of these other modern finishes you're gonna run into issues so again i'm a huge fan of these traditional finishes and i just think that they bring out the best of that this wood has to offer and especially over the stippling it just looked so so dang good once I finally got some finish on there. So with the glory shots coming up in just a second here, as always guys, I do hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next one. I mean, it's not light, but I mean...